Good afternoon and welcome back to this afternoon's session. So um, we have just heard from um, three speakers on the subject of innovating for growth in the agro-food sector. And one of the issues that has come up throughout this morning's discussion has been the issue of financing. Well, deals exactly Good with that. Good afternoon and welcome back to this afternoon's session. So um, we have just heard from three speakers on the subject of innovating for growth in the That seems to be a problem with it. Yeah, I think it is a Facebook page. Oh, okay. Hello, are we all connected? Yeah, I think so. So much technology happening at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we are now very pleased to um, have the founder of uh, this initiative, Maureen Duru, moderate the, the next panel on accessing resources for sustainable agri-food entrepreneurship. Maureen, over to you. Thank you very much, Yentil. Thanks for the great job you've done um, throughout this event. Hello, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back. And thank you very much for being with us throughout the day up till this moment. Um, it's been really inspirational listening to all the speakers and um, especially the entrepreneurs speaking about the challenges that they face. Um, we know that for entrepreneurs, irrespective of where you come from, whether you're an African or um, whichever you know background you have, the important for your the important thing for your project or one of the main research things that you need is access to resources. And when we talk about access to resources, it's not just um, finances; it could be skills, um, it could be you know transferring knowledge to, um, to entrepreneurs. So I'm really glad to be moderating this panel. Um, we have as speakers of this panel, Elk Breyers, who is an international consultant with King Bordeaux Foundation. We have um, Lamin Dabur, who is the chief executive of Ban Taba. And um, we also have Ms. Mateja Damastia, who is the CEO of Anteja. The first speaker on, um, for this panel is Ms. Um, Elk Breyers. Elk works as an independent consultant expert, as an, as an independent expert for the King Bodua Foundation. For those of you um, that do not know the King Bodua Foundation, they are um, based here in Belgium. I'm sure Echo will explain further about their work and what they do. Um, she manages the philanthropic funds that are active in developing countries. And these funds, um, they have a focus on business development. So she's among other things responsible for business partnership facility, which is a mission for the Belgian Development Corporation. So I hand over to you now, El. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for the nice introduction, Maureen. Um, I think someone was going to share my slides on, on your side. Okay. Um, uh, yes, let me do it. Okay, thank you. So good afternoon, everybody. Nice to virtually meet you all. Uh, my name is Elke, um, Elke Briers, a very difficult name in English. I'm very much aware of that, um, but I'm happy to be here and to uh, present the King Baudouin Foundation to you and especially uh, the mission we have for the Belgian uh, Development Corporation, the Business Partnership Facility. Uh, I'm still waiting for my slides. I'm sorry, but I don't think we have received them before. Yeah, sure, actually, sure you did. Actually, I'm not, uh, I don't see it. 
in the no, file we have. Sorry, I have to confirm, we haven't received your slide. I, you I sent them over so? to Maureen. Yes. I sent it to you. Um, um, they're, they're not saved. I will watch for them, but um, I haven't saved them, so I don't think I have received them. Sorry. So then I'm going to help share your slide. Sorry about that. No worries. Um. So maybe just uh, first a couple of words on, on the foundation. We are a public benefit foundation. We are based in Brussels. Uh, we work on, 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 on a lot of different topics, a lot of different programs like education, social justice, uh, health, uh, and, and, and one of the programs that, uh, that we have within the foundation, it's, it's an international uh, program, uh, mainly focused on the developing countries. Uh, so I work for this, um, there they are, <laughs> and you can go to the second slide already, thank you. So um, here you can see the, the eight main uh, programs that, that we have within, within the foundation. I work uh, mainly for the international uh, program. Uh, as I said, we, we are a, a public benefit foundation. We usually give grants to nonprofits. Uh, so most of our activities are focused on, on, on the nonprofit sector. Um, but uh, more and more, uh, we are supporting entrepreneurs, uh, startups, scale-ups um, with grants, with loans, uh, depending on, 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 on which, which stage they are in, in their development. Um, so we give mainly grants, mainly to nonprofits, but we also give grants to entrepreneurs. Uh, and one of the grant options that we have for entrepreneurs, uh, you can go to the next slide, thank you. Uh, so one of the options is the BPF, the Business Partnership Facility. Uh, so we can give financial support for the private sector involvement contributing to SDGs in developing countries. So, so just a brief summary, uh, what we support. So we are looking for entrepreneurial initiatives contributing to at least one SDG. Um, we are looking for partnerships. Uh, preferably partnerships consisting of at least one business entity. So it's important for this call that there is at least one for-profit partner. And the, the project that we want to support has to be in line with the core business of the business partner or business partners involved. The project has to be located in one of the 52 countries on the list of BioInvest. Uh, here I have to put a small remark as uh, we are in the negotiation with the uh, Belgian Development Corporation. This might change. We might limit uh, the call to, to um, African countries only, but this still has to be decided and has to be confirmed. Uh, but for now, there is no focus on a certain sector. How does it work? How, how do we support? We give non-refundable uh, grants between 50,000 and 200,000 euros, and it's a matching grant. So the for-profit partners have to contribute the same amount. There is a continuous call for projects. So the first uh, one was the beginning of 2019, and the last one will, will be at the end of 2023. And we have two selection rounds per year with a yearly budget of 2 million euros. Uh, as I said, the BBF is initiated and is funded by the DGD, by the Belgian Development Corporation, and the operational management is done by the King Baudelaire Foundation. The sixth round of applications just closed and the seventh round will open soon um, in October and then you can apply again until uh, mid-February 2022. So to say a little bit more on the target projects, uh, what we are looking for. Uh, so it must contribute to at least one SDG in developing countries. It has to be a profitable business initiative. It doesn't have to be profitable when you apply, but you have to show us in your business plan, in your financial forecast, that there is the possibility of becoming self-sustainable, of becoming profitable uh, in the medium term. 
We are looking for partnerships that bring together the private sector, civil society, research institutes, uh, the public sector, uh, north south, south south partnerships. That's all. That's all uh, possible. That's all allowed. So the partners can be Belgian, can be European, can be international entities, it, it can be uh, local entities. Uh, that's all. That's all fine for this call. And the project must be part of the core business of the business partners involved. Uh, and the project can take up to three years. So if we receive the applications, and I have to tell you that we receive a lot of applications, uh, it's about uh, 250 applications in each round. So it, it, it's, it's very competitive. Um, if we receive the applications, we look at two aspects. Uh, so first, of course, we check if the call, if, if, if the application is eligible, if it's in the right country, the right amount, uh, if it's a matching uh, fund and, and these things. But then when we look in detail uh, to the project, we look at the social impact of the project and we look at the economic viability. So the social impact um, is, of course, uh, the jobs, the full-time jobs that can be uh, created and maintained. Uh, decent jobs, that's important. Is there an improved average income for low income families? Become certain goods available uh, for low income uh, people? Um, it, it, it can be a positive impact on the environment, uh, saving natural resources. So all SDGs are equal, but the social and environmental impact has to be clear. It's all about uh, inclusive uh, growth. Uh, then we look at the economic viability as well. So it has to be a business project, a revenue creating project, and the partnership when applying uh, must clearly demonstrate that the supported initiatives will become uh, self-sustainable, uh, that they show competitive uh, financial performances, uh, signs of scalability and uh, replicabil re replicability <laughs> that it is. Uh, so social impact and economic impact uh, equally important. Um, to tell you a bit more about the funding details, so it's a non-refundable uh, grant, matching grant, so you can ask between 50,000 and 200,000 euros, but this can, this can only be up to 50% of the total investment uh, needed for the project. So this implies that the total project, of course, must be at least 100,000 euros, um, and this 50% must be uh, paid, must be funded by the for-profit partners. Partners. Um, the, the contribution of the for profit, profit partners must be a cash contribution. So, no valuation of pre existing assets, no in kind donations, and uh, also no other grants or subsidies. So, it must really be an investment of the for profit partners. Uh, the co-financing can be provided by uh, various private sector companies if you have uh, several partners and they can submit a joint application. Um, loans from financial institutions can be considered as part of the co-funding of the matching fund. Uh, you can also take the expenses until three months before the submission deadline into account uh, when you apply. Uh, we have a total budget of 12 million euros for the five years of BBF. So there is about 1 million euro available for every selection round. So that means depending on how much they are requesting, we can have between five and 20 beneficiary projects in each uh, call, in each round. Uh, my 10 minutes are almost over or I slightly passed that one, sorry. Um, so. All information can be found on our website. This is probably the most important message that I want to give to all of you. Please check out the website www.businesspartnershipfacility.be. Uh, there is all information about the application procedure, the selection process, uh, if, um, information about uh, former grantees. Uh, there is a very detailed frequently asked questions section. So please, please do not uh, hesitate to, to, to read everything in detail. But if it's not there, you can also uh, contact me. I think my email address was also on the previous slide. So if you share the slides with all participants, everybody will know how to reach me. There's also the email address on our website, so you'll know how to Thank find you. me. <laughs> Thank you very much, Shelter, for such um, 
a short but very informative um, presentation. Thank you so Thank you. much um, for, it's really important to know that you as a foundation, although your work focuses on supporting the nonprofit sector, the philanthropic sector, but you now have these facilities that are also um, accessible for businesses. And then um, what I find unique about this project is the combination, the ability for non, you know, creation of partnerships between mm -hmm. um, the nonprofit sector, the non, um, with the business, the academic. So it's the uh, to ensure that all aspects of you know the, there's a full representation of all interests, and that is quite unique. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure people will have some questions, but we'll take that at the end of um, the session. Um, our next speaker now is Mr. Lamin K. Dabwa, who is the chief executive of Bantava. Um, Lamin is from the Gambia, but he currently lives in Stockholm, Norway. Um, he studied banking and finance in India before getting a scholarship to study in Milan, Italy. So he's an experienced African diaspora um, that has lived in, in different countries of the world. And I'm sure that that has um, an influence in his organization, the setting it up and the ideas behind it. So the, now over to you, Mr. Dabo. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction, Marina. I'm very excited to be here. I think these are very important topics that we are discussing, and these are issues that we should be discussing quite often. So we are very, very happy to be part of this. So I'll just proceed with sharing my screen. Are you able to see my presentation? Fantastic, yes. Uh, so like Maureen said, I'm Lamin. I'm originally from uh, Gambia, a small country in West Africa. Uh, my background is mainly in finance, uh, but I've also been uh, quite passionate about entrepreneurship. Uh, and I've lived in different countries uh, over the last 10 years. And uh, if you look at my journey and the company that now I'm working on, uh, it's essentially a reflection of the story of the people of African origin. Uh, that I have met in different parts of the world, the knowledge, the talent, and the and the and and the and the inspirations from their journeys. It's what made up of the company that we, we, we that I'm working at right now. Uh, so as a I can scroll my presentation. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So as uh, someone from a finance background, I really like statistics and numbers because I think they truly speaks a lot about uh, topics and issues. Uh, so I thought we start with reflecting over the importance of agriculture uh, in general, but also specifically the agro-food sector within, uh, within Africa, in order to set the context for the discussion here today. Uh, as you would see, agriculture actually is the biggest component of uh, economic output on the continent. This is something that uh, has been very, very well known, and it's also one of the biggest, uh, it's one of the sectors that that employs the biggest amount of people uh, within, the, within the continent. And what this tells us is that if you want to see a developed continent, if you want to see a vibrant economy, it means that we have to put a lot of more focus on agriculture than we currently are doing. Uh, and that's something that requires a collective effort, both from policy makers, from institutions locally on the continent, but also from this huge African community outside of the continent called the diaspora. And that's why I think discussions here today are very, very important and relevant. Uh, if you looked at it, uh, despite the size and the, the, the importance of the sector within the, within the economic uh, outlook of the continent, you would see that Africa's share of global exports in terms of agricultural output has been decreasing uh, significantly over time. This is a study that has been done by McKenzie uh, along with uh, FAO. And you would see that as a percentage of our total contribution to exports globally, it has been decreasing. So right now, as, as of 2013, for example, Thailand as a country exports more agricultural outputs uh, than sub-Saharan Africa in total. And uh, if you would extrapolate this to the whole continent, 
the story would have been quite similar. So this tells us that uh, the, 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 the trend within the agricultural sector, it's something that has to be reversed. If agriculture is this important for the continent, it would, it has to be the case that we should be playing a bigger role in terms of supplying the global markets with our outputs. And how can we, how can we do this? This graph here shows how agricultural output could be, could be significantly increased uh, within the continent, right? Uh, it shows us, it essentially shows us where, it, where we can be in terms of agricultural production if the right steps are taken by individuals, by policymakers, but all as, us as well as the African community living outside of the continent. Uh, according to Mackenzie, we can literally double the current output that we are producing in terms of agro, within the agro food value chain, especially in terms of metric tons. And most of this improvement, the biggest improvement will come from yield improvement, i.e. investing in knowledge and, and, and infrastructure that would help our farmers and operators within the sector to be able to produce more output from the existing land resources that are available with the continent, right? Uh, this, this board uh, requires an investment in knowledge across the sector uh, to, shift the, to shift the agricultural landscape from a low or non-tech uh, sector to a more high-tech sector, but as well as financial investment in, that, in, in input, machinery, and infrastructure. The good news is that the diaspora can significantly contribute to filling the gaps that I've mentioned, both in terms of knowledge, but also in terms of investment. Uh, according, if we looked at it from a knowledge perspective, according to, uh, according to Pew Research, the African diaspora, particularly in the US, it's one of the most educated immigrant uh, community within the United States. There is a lot of knowledge that resides within the diaspora community both in the US, but also this is generally reflective of Europe, but also other parts of the world. I think what we need to do as diaspora is to mobilize this knowledge and, and, and allocate it effectively on the continent so that we can, we, can, we, we can increase the yield that we are seeing from the agricultural sector. That would require investment into research, but also in terms of talent. Uh, one of the previous speakers from the last panel has also has mentioned the importance of having the right knowledge and talent in order to boost productivity within the sector. And I think this is a space that the diaspora can play a very, very important role. In addition to knowledge, also the diaspora sits on a lot of wealth. And uh, this is what I call, tend to call the hidden wealth, right? We talk a lot about remittances that's go, uh, that frequently go back to Africa, to our families, to help people get by on their daily lives. Uh, but also in addition to that, there is a lot of wealth that resides within the diaspora in their countries of residence. Uh, according to the World Bank, the diaspora saves $53 billion annually. I think this is an amount of wealth. If part of this wealth can be effectively allocated to the agricultural sector within the region, I think it's going to make a lot of difference. And this is incumbent on us with on all of us within the diaspora to make sure that we are part of the change that we want to see. And how do we do that? It's either we embark as entrepreneurs within the sector, uh, but also invest in, into entrepreneurs that are already operating within the sector because they need the resources. They need the resources in order to expand their output. The opportunities in the market are quite significant for everyone that is present within the sector. Uh, according, to, according to estimates, the, 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 the growth in terms of food and beverage spending across the continent in the 10 years of 2025 would be about 167 billion. I think this is a massive market opportunity for everyone who has an interest in the continent. And uh, I would close this presentation by talking about how do we do this? How do we get the diaspora to actively engage in the agricultural sector within the continent, either as entrepreneurs or as investors? Uh, obviously, there wouldn't be. There is no silver bullet to this. It requires a lot of collective efforts. Uh, but, but my, 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 our position is that if we take these efforts collectively, it's going to make a difference. Uh, and now I will start talking about what we do at Bantaba. So we, we built a digital platform that connects the African diaspora to startups and entrepreneurs in Africa. 
Uh, and, and through this, we enable the diaspora to be able to discover startups that are on the continent, but in addition to that, be able to be able to interact with these founders and also share their knowledge and their financial resources uh, with, these, with these startups on the continent. And all these startups are solving very, very important problems. So the, and some of these problems are the issues that sent us out in the first place. So if you want to make a difference and build the Africa that we want to see, we all need to play a part on it. And it starts with supporting the entrepreneurs that are solving those challenges on the continent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lame. That's really um, a very interesting presentation um, showing, of course, we've seen it throughout this um, process of listening to people from the diaspora presenting their projects that we have a lot of knowledge and what you're doing is unique, trying to link, create this digital platform that will connect those of us in the diaspora that have the skills, that have the resources to entrepreneurs in the continent, because it's not all about um, being the, the one with the initiative, but if you have the resources to also invest in others, that goes a long way. And one thing I took from you that I never really, it's been there, but I never really paid you know, attention to it, is we always focus on the remittance, that gets sent to Africa, um, forgetting the wealth that is also in the hands of members of the African diaspora living in different parts of the world. Thank you very much for, for this presentation. Thank you. Um, now we move on to the next um, speaker, Ms. Mateja Damastia. Okay. Um, Mateja is the CEO of Anteja ECG, and she's also an expert in value chain transparency and innovation policies. Um, she has over 28 years of managerial experience. Um, Mateja um, worked, it's working on different um, areas in the agro-food sector, especially that has to do with sustainability, but as she, as she will explain this more to you in her presentation. For those that do not know, um, Anteja, it is a technology and cosetting firm with offices in Slovenia, Stuttgart, and Nairobi. Thank you very much. Anteja. Thank you so much, Maureen. Thank okay. you so much to give us a chance to be here. It's a big honor for us, you know, and I have to admit that we really enjoyed the whole conversation and the presentations today. So it's, uh, I'm also very thankful for extreme, uh, unbelievable news and uh, information that we got today that we are absolutely not, uh, we didn't get it before. And so my presentation includes some of the things that was said today, you know, and this, I would really be focused on a different angle, you know, of how to tackle the agribusinesses in Africa and how do we see that it can really become an innovation pot, you know, and also the, the pot for the growing investment in Africa. So it's my, our background, you know, it's uh, the, that we are actually consulting company, but we are moving uh, with uh, uh, our office in Nairobi to, to support the agribusinesses to the technology. And we are providing some tools which are uh, targeting transparency in market linkages for agribusiness value chains. We also offer blockchain traceability system and also moving to artificial intelligence and market, market uh, and to machine learning. However, you know, I think what is important is to share with you what actually linked me a bit to the, to the African diaspora. I was a student of Dr. Colesto Juma, who was a professor at Harvard Kennedy, and he was my dearest professor. And I worked with Professor Colesto Juma in the, in the topic which was called the New Harvest. And it was about how to use the agriculture innovation in Africa to boost the growth in Africa. This was about 15 years ago. And once Professor Juma called ask me, can we use mango to produce biomaterials? Well, this was 11 years ago, you know, it was a bit of uh, uh, science fiction questions at that time, you know, but now, you know, we are using several, you know, the, the crops and several fruits, you know, to produce biomaterials, to use it for, for different applications. And then, however, you know, if I want to really have to move there, you know, 
you know, moved to Nairobi, moved to Africa and start building myself, you know. So here is what you can see. It's how I plant one of, <laughs> of macadamia as a seedling, okay? So just to plant my tree in Africa. And let's move forward, you know, it's, I will not spend time here because it was extremely well presented before, you know, what is the issue of uh, uh, the small farmers, you know, and how they cannot really connect to the markets. And here is what we figure out, you know, doing really a lot of research in the last five years, working with about 300 uh, agribusinesses with the farmers, you know, in East Africa, in particular in West Africa, a bit on West Africa, and also with the community in, in Europe. It's about value chain transparency in a sustainability, you know. It's not only about the consumers who want to know what is in their product, it's also about, you know, what is the product impact on the value chain, starting with the, with the origin of the resources, okay? So, and how this product impact, what kind of impact it can have. Uh, social inequalities, human right, uh, rights violation, modern slavery, environmental degradation. This is all topics which was covered today, you know, but there is still truth. They are not very visible. They are not very well presented to the consumers and to the B2B market. And here can be a big shift in the next years. One of the shifts, shifts is definitely European Union law, which is going to, to, the, to the request to the companies to display the value, chain transfer, value chains, what's going on in the value chains, not only in Europe, but what is going on in the other countries where the ingredients and elements that are putting in the products uh, origin, uh, originate. So this will really change the game. We do not know how fast, you know, because it's still resistance, you know, to go to the, to the real transparency of the value chains. But we believe that this is the value which will come and will can help agribusiness in Africa. And why? Because the agribusiness in Africa are already transparent, sustainable, you know. They, they are working with the farmers, at least those that we are working with, they're working with 1,000 farmers, 10,000 farmers, 100,000 farmers, and they can provide the capacity they can provide resources to the farmers, you know. They can give the market to the farmers in the high value addition products like, you know, natural cosmetic, it can be high value addition food, it can be high value addition new materials, many, many applications. And they can provide what then happened, you know, through the value addition products can come the money, can come investments, and these investments can go directly to the list and can go to the protect environment. And you know, it's the, the solutions that we have is actually empowering the agribusiness because it gives them the simple tool which, uh, which give them a chance, you know, to transparently provide, you know, information about what they are doing, how they are doing, what is their product about. And also we are assuring, you know, that every supplier and parent partners that we are working with are 100 percent sustainable even you know when it comes to the to the cloud you know we are working for example with oracle clean cloud because because it is 100 percent powered by renewable energy so and how does this work you know how to support then you know it's not only about the agribusinesses in Africa, it's also what we can offer to the buyers, for example, in Europe. So buyers in Europe are looking for the transparent and sustainable information. But this information, there was one of the speakers presently very, very nicely before we, with these nails, you know, there is no real guidance what is sustainable information, you know. So we try to provide so so-called transparency metrics, which combine SDGs, SEGs, and all what is the uh, impact on the circular economy and give access to this information to the network, which is powered by the, by the FITO app. And what is our goal? Our goal is to create better returns through the environment, communities, and sustainable investments so that we get returns on environment, communities, and sustainable investments. So it's here is, you know, the, the current position where we are, you know, we do not have a chance, you know, to, to, to give you the video, but the PowerPoint presentation will be shared so everybody can check and click on the video to get the more information. So at the moment, you know, we, we are working in Kenya, Rwanda, Uganda, Ethiopia, Nigeria. We are linking agribusinesses to Germany, UK, into Canada. We are working with sustainable tech providers. We are integrated at the moment, artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning into our our uh, tool which will allow you know the target businesses in africa will have direct access you know to potential buyers and this value chain will be evaluated according to the sustainability criteria uh, prediction shows that in 2022, through the tools, we can empower 300 agribusinesses and we can reach 200,000 
farmers, and this means that 200,000 farmers can get access to the market. So this is just some simple, uh, some hour of clients. It's example for Mionga from Kenya. She reached with the tools Italy and also the United, uh, the uh, uh, Saudi Arabian market. There is Priceless Farm Moringa from, Kampa from Uganda, uh, who is one of the best provider of Moringa. We are linking them currently to the, to the buyers in uh, Germany. Then we have, for example, GOT organic specialty from Rwanda who are using the tools. And uh, Mara, again, from Kampala in, in Uganda, which is providing the very super good solution. He, they're engaged youth, you know, youth in the coffee business, and they're providing the, 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 at the same time, you know, the environmental and social impact and create wealth for the youth community in Uganda. So th this is what I have for today. It's, uh, I, I I thought that I'm the last one. I hope that I was fast enough, Maureen. And yes. I'm very open for any questions that may come. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Damaste, for such an interesting um, presentation regarding the work you do on sustainability and also um, the support you give to um, the support you give to Africans, um, African producers in terms of um, the details. Um, the digital support you give to African farmers to be able to link them to markets and also provide them access to uh, international buyers away from the continent. Um, my, I have a question first for Damasia and also another question for Lamin and for Elk. Um, maybe there might be other people that have questions too. Um, my first question to Damasia is to, with regards to the farmers that you support in Africa, are they dedicated to certain products or is it just all agro-food um, producers irrespective of what they grow, whether it's fruits or whether it's vegetables? And then the next question is, do you have already existing markets, you know, buyers that this, producers can key into? Or is it that you see someone that has a product um, that, that has some sort of viability, for example, a mango grower, and you go, okay, let me try and see if I can get you into the German market or into the Belgian market. How does it work? Uh, okay, thank you so much. You know, it's again, you know, we are not working directly with the farmers. We are okay. working with agribusinesses, so means processors who are uh, who do value addition to the product. We are okay. focusing, you know, not really on the let's say the traditional crops like is coffee or tea, but on the special coffee, special tea, and in particular, super fruits. Super fruits means, you know, the fruits which can be used for addition, uh, additional uh, different applications. It can be a food. It can be natural cosmetic, it can be actually natural medicine as well. Okay. And this, you know, why we can do this, you know, because we do have a presence in Germany and in Europe, you know, we do have access to the buyers who are looking for this products. Okay, this is one thing. And also, you know, through the pro projects that we have in East Africa, we figure out, you know, that the market in East Africa is growing, in particularly for these products, you know. The, there is some manufacturers who, who start producing the natural cosmetics, who start producing natural for good food, you know, and who, who care about the sustainability. So it's with a, with a, with a uh, so to answer your questions, we do have market, we do have already the clients who get access, who get the clients in Europe and in Europe and in East Africa through the applications. And for example, in Nigeria, you know, it's a link in the Shia butter, you know, so it's a Shia butter produced in Nigeria and it's going directly to UK and it's going directly to Shea butter cosmetics production. So it's already established links, you know, which are in this area. Okay. And in particular, what we can confirm is that this topic of sustainability, SDGs, CCGs, you know, that there is not only interest of consumers, it's also in the interest of the buyers who are producing sustainable products. Okay, thank you very much. That answers my questions. Um, for Lamy, um, with regards to the digital platform that you mentioned, that is connecting, you know, entrepreneurs from the diaspora to people within the continent, do you already have a, a list of um, how do you source who gets on this platform? Or is it that people just have access to this digital platform and they register? 
is there a selection process to match people to you know who they can support or the areas that they can invest in yeah thank you for that question so um, i mean the platform itself it's open uh, so it's publicly available to our target audience and the, our target audience here are the startups that are in africa right and the african diaspora the community itself uh, and, and what we do is that when startups, for example, are coming onto the platform, we try to understand as much as possible about their businesses. So they have, an, in addition to having an opportunity, opportunity to explain what they are doing, they also have an opportunity to tell us, for example, what type of skills and knowledge gaps do they have in their companies and what areas of expertise are they looking for from the diaspora community and what type of engagement would this be? Are they looking for mentors or are they looking for consultants or are they just looking to broaden their network perhaps because they want to they want to have a go to market strategy to some of these markets that the diasporas are living in right uh, on, and on the other side we have the diaspora as well and when they create a profile we try to understand their background their experience but most importantly we ask them about their interest to engage with startups uh, on the continent at what type of engagement that would be whether they want to mentor or they want to do consulting for a startup or they are there just to, uh, to identify attractive investment opportunities within the ecosystem. And then what we do then is to use this information to match the startups with the people in the diaspora that are in a position to help them. So a startup, for example, from Nigeria who is looking for someone with a background in finance because they want to have, have a second look on their pitch deck or want, they want to assess their investor readiness. When they are on the platform, they will be able to see that Lamin is a diaspora from Gambia, living in Sweden, and he has a background in finance and venture capital. But, more, but furthermore, he is also interested to support startups on the continent. And then from there, the startup can connect with me on the platform. They can initiate a conversation to understand how I could support them in their journey. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. That clarifies um, a lot of the questions or a lot of the misunderstanding I had initially. Okay, for Elke, my question has to do with the funding that is accessible for businesses from the amount you mentioned between 50,000 and 200,000, that will not be accessible to startups or smaller companies because some of them, for example, in African countries do not have access to this. Um, is it, does the funding or the criteria allow partners to come from different countries? Assuming there is a startup in, in an African country that has the idea that needs to be upscaled, but there is also an organization or another entity in a European country or somewhere else. Can they create this partnership that needs Together. to happen? Yes, yes, definitely, definitely. So the partners don't have to come from the same country country, it, it, it's definitely an option uh, that they co-create a project. Yes. But concerning uh, the question, if it's a really startup, if there is like no proven business, if they don't have any financial information, no proof of concept, then it's too early to apply for BBF. So we really request that it's a, an existing business with a proof of concept uh, before they apply. Okay. So it hence the, the, the minimum amount of 50,000 euros. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much to all the panelists. Um, I'm sure that there are a lot of the participants that the information you've shared today will be useful to, to them. Um, those that have projects in Africa already and those that are planning to start up businesses, those that have skills that they want to use in impacting um, positively on others that are already in the, in the continent with um, established uh, projects. So thank you so much. And um, at this point, I'll also hand, before I hand over to Yentil, I want to specially say a great thanks to all the people that um, participated in this um, fifth African Diaspora Growth Food Forum. Um, I thank you for the confidence that you really shown in our ideas and the, 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 you know, what we are hoping to achieve. I thank the Kole CP 
who have really backed us because without them, um, the challenges would have been greater for, for us. I, I thank, I'm really going to mention some of the staff of, uh, staff of Colette CP, um, Mrs. Solina Boto, um, Axel, Geto, and all the technical team and all the translators. Thank you, thank you so much. And I thank all our organizing partners, Sanka and the Botanic Garden of Messe. Thanks to all the speakers. Yentil, you have the last one. Thank you so much for what you've done, thanks. Thank you for that, those closing words, Maureen. And I think one thing that has been emphasized in this forum today is the wealth that lies in the diaspora. And Maureen, as the founder of this forum, you are exemplary of that. So it's to you we owe thanks. So thank, thank you. you very much, Maureen, for this initiative, for bringing us all here together today and reinvigorating and encouraging us to continue building these links because we can build the world we want to see, we can build the future we want, and we're doing that together between generations and we're learning from each other. So I'm very inspired going forward um, with this uh, forum, with all the participants, I'm very um, moved by all the presentations and the fact that we were able to bring together a very diverse uh, uh, series of panelists and participants who were able to share their knowledge on policy, access to finance, entrepreneurship, and the great examples we saw from the entrepreneurs themselves. I want to end by um, reference to um, a saying that I, I often cite to myself to remind myself of my own journey. And it comes from um, one of my favorite thinkers, uh, Franz Fanon. He says, every generation must find its mission and fulfill it or betray it. And together, I hope we are on the path to fulfilling our mission to building the world we want to see. Thank you very much for attending this fifth African Diaspora Agri-Food Forum, and we look forward to working with you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.